my name's Steven. Uh, I'm made in the image of God. Um, I grew up in a good family. Um, you know, nothing really traumatic happened to me. Um, I grew up going to church, like probably most of you guys. You know, I went to all the services. I went to all the vacation Bible schools, all the camps. I heard all the sermons. Um, but I didn't know the Lord. I didn't have a real, real relationship with him. Um, so, uh, you know, as a result, as I was growing up, we were, me and my friends were heavily influenced by uh, the older people at my school and around the neighborhood uh, that were in gangs and, um, you know, doing drugs and selling drugs. And, uh, and that life was glorified in my eyes, in our eyes. Um, and, I, and I thought it was cool. Um, so as a result, when junior high and high school came around, um, I, I completely fell away and drifted. I started smoking weed, you know, started drinking, started partying, um, dabbling with hard drugs. And uh, eventually I got heavily addicted to cocaine. Um, from there, my life began to slowly unravel. Uh, my life revolved around drugs and and my friends, and that, that was it. Um, began selling weed and you know, committing little crimes to, to make sure that I always had some. And, uh, and it was fun, it was fun to me, to be honest. Um, but shortly after high school, I remember I was eating uh, food with one of my friends. We had been up all night partying, um, and he asked me, you know, hey Steve, you got $20 I could borrow? And, um, and I asked him, oh, what do you need it for? And he said, you know, to be honest, I've been I've been smoking meth, and I needed to get to get high. I want to get high. Um, I knew I knew a lot of the older people were were doing it, and I knew it was bad, but I did it anyways. Uh, I took him to get some, and uh, I took my first hit of meth, and and that was a wrap. Uh, my life began to quickly spiral out of control. Um, I became reckless. I was short-tempered, even violent. Um, the crimes got more and more serious, and. Um, you know, I was constantly getting kicked out of my house and uh, wild now running amok on the streets, and, and it was all fun to me. You know, it was, it was fun. It was, I was just kind of lost. Um, and that was my life for a long time. I would, uh, I would be running amok on the streets. I would get caught for a crime. I would go to jail. Then when I was in jail, I would tell myself, you know what, I'm never going to do this again. And then, you know, get out and do the whole thing again. And that, that was my life for a long time. It was a vicious cycle. My parents prayed for me for over 10 years to, um, to change, that the Lord would intervene on my behalf. Um, you know, because of the lifestyle I was living, I was in a lot of dangerous situations. In 2011, I ended up getting shot three times. Um, one of the bullets ruptured an artery in my leg, and uh, I should have bled out. I should have died. But the Lord had mercy on me. Um, and I know that if I would have had I died that day, um, I would have spent eternity in hell but he had mercy on me. Um, and even after that, I didn't, I didn't turn to the Lord. I just kept going in my, in my rebellion. And, um, and yeah, it's been 2013, um, I ended up going to jail again on a probation violation, but this time it was different because I was locked down in a two-man cell, 22 hours a day. Um, and I was, this time I was really broken. You know, I wanted to change, but I couldn't. I was just so enwrapped in my sin and my addictions. Um, so I cried out to the Lord. I said, God, you know, I've been hearing, hearing about you my whole life, and um, if you can help me, then help me. Um, well, the Lord sent someone to me. He was a fellow inmate to um, talk to me, and he started walking me through the scriptures and, um, you know, telling me about judgment and the road is narrow and not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, and before he went to prison, he, he gave me a study Bible. And I started reading the, the Bible 14 hours a day. My mom was sending me books through the mail. Um, she was coming every weekend to visit me and do Bible studies with me and just kind of teach me things that I was, I was telling her I was learning through the Word. And it was at that time that the Holy Spirit really regenerated my heart and allowed me to see the reality of all, all that I had been hearing my whole life, you know, Jesus, heaven, hell, grace, and power. And, um, and it was at that, that, that time that the Lord revealed to me my purpose, which is to learn the scriptures and be able to teach it to others because that's where I found life and I wanted to give life to others. Um, so yeah, that's why I'm here at Biola. I'm a biblical studies major, I'm a junior, um, and I'm just thankful for what Jesus did in my life um, and for what he does, not just to get us into heaven, but so that we can live in, in freedom and walk by the Spirit now 
and so that we can experience the abundant life now. Uh, my name is Stephen, and I'm made in the image of God. Hey guys, I'm Doug Smith. I'm a junior business management major here at Biola, and I am made in the image of God. Before coming to Biola, I served in the Marines for four years, and at that time I believed in God, but I didn't know the gospel. And now that I'm here at Biola, I've had the opportunity to look back on my life, specifically in the time when I was in the Marines, and see God's character. I've learned that he is a good father who watches over me and protects me from my enemies. Also, I've learned that he is faithful to keep his promises and love me even at my darkest. I know I can take refuge in him, and the enemy cannot touch me. The most amazing fact about all of this is that I didn't know Jesus when I was in the Marines. It wasn't until after the Marines when I found Christ. And that is why I'm here, to share God's faithfulness, his unfailing love, and his character through my story. In my Marine Corps career, I deployed to Afghanistan twice. After being in Afghanistan for over a month, my second deployment, I was assigned to a patrol base just south of one of the, mo of the major bases in Afghanistan for the purpose of providing security as a designated marksman and a radio operator. I was there for about five months, and with me I brought a Bible that I literally knew nothing about. I didn't even know the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I brought it because I knew it would give me strength. It was exactly what I needed because 24 hours within my first day on the patrol base, we hit three bombs, injuring 15 people. The reality I was in hit fast and it hit hard. Knowing that I was in that situation, I started praying to God every night throughout the entire deployment. Before I'd go to sleep, before I'd go on a patrol, I would ask him to protect me from the enemy and from any danger I was constantly surrounded by. And as time progressed, it seemed like everyone around me was getting injured. The, the deployment kept getting worse and worse. My good friend, who I knew very well, who I trained with, before the deployment, got shot twice. And I was one of the first Marines to respond to it. I knew I needed strength, so when I had the chance, I opened up the Bible <laughs> that I knew nothing about, and the first book I opened to was Job. Yeah. <laughs> I read Job, and God strengthened me through that. He strengthened my heart in the midst of all the pain and tragedy. As my, as my time on the patrol base was wrapping up, one of my officers came to me and told me that I would be the designated marksman for a security mission a week before it took place. I was going back to a place I was very familiar with because I had been there before. But when it came, to gear when it came time to gear up, I received the orders to stand down. I was no longer the designated marksman for the mission. It was God, I, looking back, I see it as God protecting me. And the reason, the reason being is because it was the most gruesome mission my team had ever gone on. On the mission, the team was attached, that I was attached to, was ambushed by a vehicle-borne IED, which is a bomb in a, in a car. And shortly after, they received machine gun fire and RPGs, which is rocket-propelled grenades. As a result, a master sergeant died and many others were injured. And the master sergeant uh, left behind a wife and two children. The team that I was supposed to be ta attached to came back and we started talking. And as, we're, as I was thinking and reminiscing and looking back on my time on that patrol base, I realized something. I realized that out of four squads, two maps, which are Marine assault platoons, we hit, had hit over 20 bombs, been in multiple enemy engagements, RPGs, you name it. My squad alone hit over half those bombs. My squad leader and many of the members had struck up to five. Several of them suffered from traumatic brain injuries, PTSD, and many other injuries. Furthermore, everyone on the patrol base had hit a bomb, and there was about 50 people on this patrol base. 
The only one who didn't hit a bomb was me. It's not a coincidence that I prayed for God's protection and he protected me from it. I realized God was faithful to protect me and deliver me from all the danger that encompassed me. 2 Samuel 22, verses 2 through 7 says this. He said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you save me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. For the waves of death encompassed me, the torrents of destruction assailed me, the cords of Sheol entangled me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord, and to my God I called. From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry came to his ears. I am Doug, and I am made in the image of God. Hi, I'm Granisha, um, and I'm made in the image of God. When I first started college, I was working three part-time jobs to pay my way through school. I was at the age of 18. Um, I was attending community college at the time. I graduated in 2009. Um, my parents never verbalized to me that um, they couldn't pay for my education after high school. They never once discouraged me um, about the idea of college, but they never were, um, they were, um, excuse me, they never verbalized to me they couldn't afford to pay for my education after high school, but um, they never once discouraged me about the idea of college, but they were very honest with me about the reality that they couldn't pay. Um, there were many years of resentment and frustration about the concept of a college fund. All of my friends left um, high school and could pay for college. I was going off to a community college and um, I just didn't understand. So there were so many uh, questions about money so many uh, frustrations, and I just didn't understand why it was so hard for me to, to go to school. I felt like every semester was a battle to afford my, co my college classes, and I was so angry. I was so angry with God about uh, saving and working so hard. I worked so hard, and I could barely save up for one semester, and I would have to drop out. So I, I just faced so many financial dilemmas which led, to, um, which led me to having to skip out, obviously, on semesters of school. At this point, I'm losing hope. I had no idea what God was doing and what my purpose entailed. So my parents couldn't help me, and I found myself praying a lot and simply asking the Holy Spirit to show me what I was supposed to do and where I was supposed to be in my season. My prayers became very bold, and I just desired answers. I yearned to know what my future looked like. I yearned to get in higher education. So I was constantly asking. Every day, every moment, I'm at work and I'm asking, God, what am I doing here? Where do you want me? Where am I supposed to be? I'm desiring for the Holy Spirit to speak to me. So there was a total of four semesters that I had to skip out on. Um, I had no idea that God had designed those four semesters to be some of my best. Every semester I had to drop out, uh, drop out of school, God opened a door for me to travel overseas and serve on the mission field. I went to a different country every semester. And when I saw doors open, when I say doors opened, they were flying open. I mean, I had never seen so much financial provision before in my life. I could barely save for school. People were calling me saying, I hear you were offered to go here. Let me pay for you. I mean, that's how miraculous these opportunities for me to travel were. And you can imagine I was just as stunned because I'm, I'm just like confused and, and okay, I'll go, I'll go. Obviously, I will go. So when I, um, I attended, I, I would go to these countries and find out that God was truly asking me to surrender my education to him. And when I say surrender, I mean lay it all at his, at his feet and give it all to him. Deuteronomy 31.6 has been my life verse. It's, it's always going to be my verse. It's something that I, that, like the Holy Spirit would lead me to when I was on the mission field and I, or I was at work or 
wherever I was in the struggle of, of not knowing what my season looked like, Deuteronomy 31, 6 was always the verse that God would speak to me through. Then this was it. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble and dread before them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not fail you or abandon you. So for the past seven years of my college missionary journey, the Lord has taught me to never fear money, to walk in fear, um, to not walk in fear, excuse me, but to be fearless that God's promises will come to pass. And I am made in the image of God, and you are as well. Okay? So fear is not of the Lord. And if you're operating in fear and you're going on a missions trip and you have no idea how you're going to pay for that or you're registered for your spring semester and you have no idea how you're going to pay for that either, I just want to release the spirit of peace over you, the Holy Spirit, peace and rest, and know that God is a God who provides everything, every little penny. He sees that, and he's like, I will write the check for you, my son, my daughter. Thank you. I'm Kate, and I'm made in the image of God. I'm a cinema and media arts major in roughly my junior year, and um, you know that Biola student stereotype? That was me, <laughs> like completely. I was raised in a Christian home in New York. Um, my parents are both believers. I went to a Christian school. I graduated from Christian school, and then I went to a tiny little Christian Bible college that's more conservative than Biola, believe it or not. And then I joined the Air Force, which was like, no, it's really bizarre. I'm like the bookish nerdy type who'd rather sit in her dorm room and read books than do anything physical outside. So me like joining the military, People laughed at me, let's just put it that way. Um, but I survived. I cried every day for the first weeks of, four weeks of basic training. Um, but I got out, I went to tech school, and it was at a joint post, so the Marines would run under my window at 4.30 in the morning yelling at me to get up. Um, then I became a radio and television broadcaster and got shipped to Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota. I learned everything the hard way. I learned that in my branch of the military, if you don't swear, people just won't talk to you. I learned that my supervisor thought I was way too sheltered to be good to, for anybody. And I learned that um, an office cubicle is like my personal equivalent to like the seventh circle of hell. <laughs> like seriously, it's, it's not good. Um, after six months at Ellsworth, I had a suicide plan and the means to carry it out. I went home on leave for two weeks and my dad found out about my plan and he threw out the pills. Uh, he saved my life, he was looking out for me. I went back to Ellsworth, I actively sought out help from their mental, serv mental health services, which effectively tanked my career. Um, I was moved to non-deployable status and I was stuck in South Dakota. Then I, made a <laughs> then I met a guy named Eli and we fell in love and he gave me a ring with a purple rock on it and I got this pretty white princess dress that had about 2,000 layers of tulle in the skirt, and three months before I was supposed to get married, he walked into my room and broke it off, like, just out of the blue. And I was devastated. Uh, he was the first guy to ever ask me out, and I thought no one else would want me. Till about a month later, when I met Matthew, he was older than I was by about nine years. He was a real smooth talker, and he wanted me. We jumped immediately into a relationship that was way too physical from day one. Um, within about three months, we were living together. Uh, then I found out he was in legal trouble with the Air Force, and he wasn't divorced like he said he was, and I stayed with him, partly because I felt like I couldn't leave, and partly because I thought maybe he could learn to love me. Our relationship wasn't just morally wrong, it was abusive, and I never actually felt safe or worthy or loved. My career in the Air Force spiraled out of control. I got kicked out for stupid stuff like being late to work. Uh, I found a little job at a little deli, um, but because I got kicked out, I was, again, stuck in South Dakota. 
Two weeks after I got kicked out, Matthew drugged and raped me. It's taken me about three years to be able to process through that, to be able to verbalize this. About three days after I was raped, two days after I quit my depression meds, cold turkey, and started withdrawals, and one day after I was convinced that everything was completely and utterly hopeless, I was in the back at work washing dishes, and I looked out this little window to the seating area, and my grandpa was there getting a, a uh, filling up a soda. And I walked around the corner, and my dad was standing there. They flew in from New York State without telling me and they didn't even know what deli I worked at, so they'd been looking in delis all morning searching for me and only ended up at the one that I worked at because they were hungry and it was time for lunch. <laughs> they offered me a way home and I took it. Uh, we packed up my little Volkswagen Beetle with everything that would fit and started driving east. We got home on my grandpa's birthday, March 18th of 2012. And so everybody was gathered at my house. There was a cake, there was a big party, and my mom runs out to the end of the driveway with her arms outstretched. And for the first time in my life, I actually understood what grace is and what mercy is. I was waiting for God to punish me for all of the terrible stuff that I did, and he didn't. He just loved me. <laughs> And now I'm here, I'm in film school in California. How cool is that? I mean, God has done incredibly more than I could ever have dared to dream on my own. God is so good and he loves us so much. He loves you so much. I hope that you come to realize that while you're here. So, my name's Kate and I'm made in the image of this incredible God. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.